Hello viewers, welcome back to our series of lectures on the topic absorption spectra. Uh, in this, we are talking about UV visible spectroscopy. Uh, in today's session, we will talk about two important things here that is recording of the spectrum, that means how do we record. And then thereafter, we will also take up the principle of spectrophotometry, that means how do we put this uh, measurement of spectrum and the kind of spectra we get into use. We will take up certain applications as well in the process. Uh, the session is planned as follows. To begin with, we will try to review what we did in the previous sessions. Thereafter, uh, we will see that how do we record a UV, UV visible spectrum. In this context, we will talk about the principle of a spectrophotometer, that means what is the basis on which this machine works. Thereafter, uh, we will take up two different types of spectrophotometers and we will talk that how does one record spectrum with these spectrophotometers. Thereafter, we will briefly touch upon the sample handling part of it, that means what kind of sample handling devices are used for the purpose. Then uh, we will talk about the principle of UV visible spectrophotometry, uh, wherein we talk about two important uh, laws, that is uh, Beer's law and the Lambert's law. And then lastly, we will take up a few applications of UV visible spectrophotometry. Having done all this, we will try to sum up what we do in today's session. Let us make a beginning by reviewing what we did in the previous sessions. Uh, in the previous sessions, we defined spectroscopy and outlined its significance. Thereafter, uh, we explained the origin of UV visible spectrum. Having done that, we moved on to describing a UV visible spectrum and explain its characteristics in detail, wherein we talked about the position, uh, intensity and width and things like that. Thereafter, we discussed the factors which affect UV visible spectrum. This we took up in very much details because essentially that is the crux of UV visible spectroscopy, wherein we see that how do different factors affect uh, energy level diagram or the energies of the molecular orbitals involved in the transitions there. And then thereafter, we explained the concept of color and also related it to uh, the concept of conjugation in the molecules, which actually came in the context of a factor uh, in the context of UV visible spectrum there. Okay. Now, let us now take up how do we record a spectrum because by now we know that uh, that a spectrum is coming as a consequence of the interaction of radiation in the UV visible range with the material. Now, how do we record such a spectrum there? Let us see that. To record a such a spectrum, we need an instrument called as a spectrophotometer. Now, in the spectrophotometer, this actually gives you a brief outline, a schematic representation of a sample uh, spectrophotometer here. There are certain essential components in a spectrophotometer. Let us quickly talk about this. Firstly, to make uh, any measurement of a spectrum, we need to have some kind of a radiation source, which for UV visible typically happens to be a deuterium or a tungsten lamp. Deuterium lamp is used for the UV range and tungsten lamp is used for the visible range. Now, we have a source. From the source, radiations are coming. The source actually is a polychromatic source. That means, lot of wavelengths are coming simultaneously from there. So, we cannot make all these radiations fall on the sample and then try to measure that. It is difficult. So, what is done is we use a device called as monochromator. As the name suggests, monochromator is a device which takes this polychromatic input and gives an output which is monochromatic. That means, it gives me radiations of one single wavelength it could be say 200, 201, 202 or whatever I want it to be. So, we can tune that. So, this is device is called as a monochromator. Thereafter, that means you have a sample, uh, there you have a source, radiations are coming which are polychromatic, pass through a monochromator, you get a monochromatic radiation, make that fall on a sample here. That means, you have a cuvet which is typically a quartz cuvet wherein the sample is taken. And then, we make this radiation fall on this and if the sample has some absorbing uh, uh, kind of a chromophore or something like that, some of the radiation will be absorbed and whatever comes out of it, that will be detected by the detector, which typically is taken as a PMT, is a photomultiplier tube, which essentially this radiation actually gets amplified in the process. And then thereafter, this detected uh, signal is sent to an output device, which gives out uh, some kind of a spectral output. All these things can be manipulated there. The basic premise here is we need to know that there are five different components which are a must for any spectrophotometer to be put into use. Okay. Now, when we make use of these, because this is just a, uh, a kind of schematic representation here of essential components, but typically when we use spectrophotometers, there are two types available there. 
one is called as a single beam spectrophotometer and second is a double beam spectrophotometer. Let us look at uh, these two devices. The first one is single beam photo, uh, spectrophotometer that is how it goes. That is you have a source, source basically since we are talking about a UV visible spectrophotometer. So, we need to have two sources because you cannot have a single source which can give you radiation right from 200 to 800 nanometers. So, we use say this will may, may be a say representation only it could be a deuterium lamp here which gives you radiation into 200 to 400 nanometers there. Then we got a tungsten lamp here which can give you radiation from 400 to 800 nanometers. So, depending on which region we want to make use of that means suppose I want I, I expect the molecule to absorb in the UV range I will select this particular source or this as the case may be or maybe sometimes we can spread over the whole range. So, there is a provision of switching over the two uh, sources there. Okay. Now, what we do is the radiation from this source either this one or this one UV or the visible source they fall on a mirror here from the mirror they get reflected and come on to the monochromator here and then thereafter the monochromator this comes out and the monochromatic radiation is coming this is made to fall on a reference compartment here let us understand this. Typically when we make a measurement of a UV visible spectrum we, what we do is we normally either it is a gaseous uh, uh, material or more often than not it is a, a solution phase by and large it is solution phase. So, what we do is you make a solution of the compound we want to measure. So, that solution is taken into some kind of a cubit as I mentioned a quartz cell there. Now, when this radiation is coming suppose this is my quartz cell which contains my sample here this is monochromatic radiation which is coming. Okay. When it comes and hits it here so the molecules which come in the path here they absorb this radiation and the radiation is coming out whatever is not absorbed that will be detected here. But this sample here I am choosing here uh, that solution I have taken that contains two different kinds of moieties or maybe more than two. One is the compound of interest which I want to make measurement of and second is other materials there maybe solvent itself or maybe some buffer system is there or some salts are there or whatever is there. So, I do not want to know uh, I do not want to measure that I want only my compounds uh, UV spectrum to be recorded there. So, what do we do is we start with taking the reference first that means, I just take uh, this reference basically is the same cuvette which contains everything, but the, the compound I want to make measurements of. So, this is basically so called the solvental system. Then I make this radiation pass to this and then see how much is it absorbed here. Okay. So, and this actually is done over a whole range. What does it mean is this like we have seen number of spectra so far. So, we find that the spectra will be something like this that means, we start from about 200 nanometers say to 300 nanometers or 200 to 700 whatever the range may be. How do we go about it? How do we go about it is like this you have a sample here there is a source which is polychromatic you use a monochromator here and then you have some kind of a tuning device that tuning suppose I want to run a spectrum for a given molecule say from 200 to 350 nanometers how do I go? What do I do is I take my sample here in the cubit then this is my source I tune my monochromator which can be done all automatically our computers can control that the only thing is I am talking about the concept part of it. I instruct my machine to give me radiations starting from 200 nanometers to 350 nanometers I can pre decide that. Then what happens this monochromator gradually tunes itself gives me radiation of 200 nanometers first 200 nanometers comes strikes it here and then whatever is absorbed or not absorbed it comes out from here it is detected by the detector sent for the signal uh, computer there. Then 201 comes 202, 3, 4, 5. So, we start from 200 and then you can choose what is the step length over there I mean say if you want to units of 1 or 2 centimeter or whatever uh, 2 nanometers or whatever you can choose that. So, when the whole range passes through so for every wavelength this measurement is made and then stored into a machine the computer over there memory. Then once you have done the reference there thereafter what you do is you bring the sample here. Now, this contains the uh, reference that means, the, the blank so to say and also the compound of interest to me I repeat the whole process all over again. Then either manually or by with the help of a machine we can subtract uh, the spectrum of the reference from that of the sample or the solution here and get the spectrum of the compound I want to make measurement of. This is a little tedious process and this, this process can be 
uh, kind of simplified by using a second kind of a spectrophotometer called as a double beam spectrophotometer. Basically, means the same, a slight variation is there, less silly. So, what do we have? We have similar situation as before, we have source here, UV visible sources are there, radiation is coming, falling on the monochromator. You have an additional device here, this is called as a beam splitter. What happens is, when the monochromatic radiation comes from here, this is split into two parts there, two equivalent uh, parts there. So, one of them falls through a mirror onto the reference and one of them falls onto the through another mirror onto the sample compartment. That means, we are simultaneously measuring the sample as well as the reference compound there. And then the two photochromators there, that means there are two uh, detectors over there which could be PMT or whatever and then whatever the difference of the signals comes here that is amplified and sent for the output device from there what you get the spectrum there. So, this is a much uh, convenient a uh, proposition. So, since we is not there are not two beams there only thing is we are taking a single beam a single uh, monochromatic radiation splitting into two parts there that is why it is called as a double beam spectrophotometer. Everything else as I just mentioned remains the same that means we have the same instruction there start from a given wavelength go to another wavelength and then steps you can define there. So, everything happens the same way as I mentioned earlier in the context of a single beam spectrophotometer. Okay. So, that is as regards our measurement or making uh, recording spectrum. Let us move further and see that how do we because this is a little uh, important here that how do we handle the sample here. Sample handling basically means that normally as I mentioned earlier also the spectrum is typically taken uh, either in the vapor phase or in solution most often in solution only. So, when we do that we need to have some container to hold this and the container happens to be uh, as I mentioned again before also that is we typically take a quartz or a glass cell called as a cubit. Now, quartz is most often used glass also can be used if I am making measurements in the visible range because glass is not uh, that good a material to use quartz is the one and it is little expensive, but uh, it is more often than not we use quartz and these quartz come in different shapes there could be different path lengths because uh, what happens is the two of the faces the, the, suppose I look at this cubit here. So, there are four faces there one two and two behind this. So, any two opposite faces will be opaque and then two will be transparent there. So, one that which are transparent will be used for making measurements there. So, the that means, and then what happens is this cubit have come in different uh, thickness or the path lengths. Suppose I got a cubit this thick, maybe it is 1 centimeter, I can have double the thickness, or maybe I have a half a centimeter, or even 1 millimeter or 0.1 millimeter, all of them are possible there. So, depending on what is your sample size, because suppose I am using a bigger cubit, I need more material for that. So, all kind of variations are possible, you can even make a continuous measurement here, you can make the sample get in there and come out of it here. So, as a function of time also we can make measurements there. So, but as I will restate there that glass cubits cannot be used for UV range, maybe for visible we can think of using it, but for UV range because glass absorbs in UV range, so we will not be getting a good spectrum there. Okay. So, that is as regards our sample handling. Now, Another thing which you have to keep in mind is the choice of solvent there, because when you are making a solution we, what we want is we want to know the spectrum of the material of interest to me and not the other materials other things over there. If I take a solvent and now suppose uh, because solvent will always be in bulk because I, when typically we use very dilute solutions there. If you got a dilute solution the concentration the amount of the substance in question is very small that a solvent is very large. If solvent also absorbs in that particular range then the absorption of solvent will be much larger than that of the sample there, then the my signal will be masked totally. So, I will not be getting any meaningful signal. So, the first requirement is the solvent must be transparent within the wavelength range which we want to make measurements there. And second requirement is which is typically done is that we use UV or spectroscopy grade solvents there. Basically, these solvents are highly purified, so that there is no traces of any impurity which can absorb, because we want to have uh, good out uh, from the material. Thirdly, typically most often than not routinely speaking we use water as a solvent because that is a very very good solvent for variety of kind of uh, materials there or sometimes we use uh, ethanol which again has got a good cut off because all solvents because we can get from any uh, reference source there uh, cut off ranges that means you have different solvents we know the cut off ranges that means a given solvent will work only 
above this range, not before the, below that. So, we have to choose an appropriate solvent for making measurements there. Okay. Let us move further and let us see we, why now we know what is a spectrum, we have done that earlier, now we know how to make a measurement of that. But how do I put to use, let us understand uh, this actually is called as spectrometry or spectrophotometry, UV visible spectrophotometry or spectrometry both are equivalent terms used interchangeably. Let us understand the principle of this. The principle of this is as follows, basically as I have been just talking about, now suppose I take a monochromatic radiation, make it fall on a sample, say this is my cubit here which contains my sample here, I am making a monochromatic radiation coming and falling on that. When it falls on it, what is shown here is that part of it is absorbed, part might get reflected back, something is reflected, something is absorbed and something else is transmitted out there. So, basically our interest here in spectrophotometry or spectrometry is in terms of the relationship between the intensity of radiation which is falling on this on the material and what is coming out of it because this difference is going to give me what is absorbed. Okay? So, that is what we need to understand the relationship between and this is given in terms of a very famous uh, law which is used practically day in day out by any uh, organic chemist which is using spectrophotometry and that is called as a beer Lambert's law. This in fact actually is made up of two different laws there and that is called as Boger or Lambert's law which basically relates the light absorption and the thickness of the absorbing medium. And second is the Beer's law which relates the light absorption and the concentration of the absorbing medium. These two put together actually give me what is called as a Beer Lambert's law. We will let us learn each one of them uh, because they are important for us to uh, make use of them. Okay. First the Lambert's law. Lambert's law basically says uh, the amount of monochromatic light which is absorbed by a substance is proportional to the intensity of the radiation that is true in both the cases. And also the second thing is uh, again very very crucial here that is the intensity of the transmitted light decreases exponentially when the thickness of the substance through which the light is passing increases linearly. What does it mean? What does it mean is this? Now suppose uh, let me take again the same example. I am having a cuvette say of thickness of uh, say 1 centimeter. Okay. I am having radiation, let me say the intensity happens to be 100 units. Let me make another assumption that this thickness is such or the concentration material is such that it decreases the intensity by say 10 percent. So, if it is 1 centimeter here, 100 is intensity inside here, what is coming out will be, let me incident uh, intensity is the intensity of the incident light is 100 units, what comes out as a transmitted light is 90 units, 10 percent has been absorbed. Now, suppose I take double the thickness, now what will happen? Suppose again same radiation is coming, 100 units is coming, if, if I go by the common sense, I would expect since the rate has doubled, I should expect 80 over here, it is not 80. What basically happens is, this is 100, so it was, it was there, it is 90 is coming here, so on the second part of it, 90 is falling on that and 10 percent of 90 is 9, so what will come out of it will be 81. So, that is the meaning of uh, exponential variation there. Okay. Now, if I look at uh, from mathematically speaking, mathematically this can be expressed as follows that is log of I naught by I, I naught is the intensity of the incident radiation, I is the transmitted radiation that is given uh, to be equal to, so K is the proportionality constant there and then B it happens to be the thickness of the absorbing medium, say it is 1, 2, 3 or whatever. So, since this k is a constant, 2.303 is a constant, we can put them together, make it as k prime b. So, log of i naught by i is equal to uh, k prime b, that is my mathematical expression for the Lambert's law. So, that is I just mentioned that i naught and i represent the intensities of incident and the transmitted light passing through a slab of thickness b. Slab means basically the my absorbing medium's thickness there. Okay. Let us take up the second law now, Beer's law. As I mentioned earlier, Beer's law basically concerns the dependence of intensity of transmitted light on the concentration of the solution there. What does it mean? That means, if I take my absorbing medium is this, say 1 centimeter, 100 is coming there. Suppose I take uh, my solution is say 0.1 molar and suppose 100 unit is the intensity coming there, let me say again, let me assume 10 percent is absorbed. So, I get 90 here. Okay. Now, suppose 
I increase my uh, intensity remains the same, I increase the concentration, then the radiation which is coming out will be lesser and that will be determined by the concentration uh, because what will happen is if I increase the concentration, suppose I had certain concentration, so in this path where the radiation is going to pass through this, there will be certain number of molecules which will come in the path of it, they are the possibility of absorbing radiation. Suppose I increase the concentration, there will be more molecules which can come in the path and there will be more absorption there. And mathematically speaking, this is given by a similar expression there that is log of I naught by I to be equal to K double prime 2.303 C, C is the concentration here for me. So, this is another constant here. So, these are the things we all know of that I naught is the intensity of incident light, I of transmitted light, K prime is a con K double prime is a constant, C is the concentration. Now, let us go further and see if I combine the two laws, what do I get? Mathematically speaking, because on the left hand side on both the thing expressions we remember, we had log of I naught by I, that is that's the relationship between I naught that is incident radiation, intensity and that of the transmitted radiation. So, combine the two laws, the expression comes out to be log of I naught by I to be equal to A B C, simple to remember. Now, what, what is this A B C? Let us understand. B we know is the thickness of the medium, what is the size of the cubit I am taking. C is the concentration, we will talk about that also, what are the units for that and then A, A is called as absorptivity. So, A is a constant of proportionality now, which is basically made up of K double K prime, K double prime 2.303 into 2.303 or put together is one constant called as absorptivity. B is the thickness of the medium and C is the concentration. Now, if the concentration is taken in terms of gram per decimeter cube, which is normally used uh, by the biochemists there and B we take in terms of centimeter, normally it is centimeter only and then A will have the units of centimeter inverse, gram inverse, decimeter cube and this is called as absorptivity. But more often than not what we do is we try to use the concentration in terms of mole per decimeter cube because that is more convenient and more uh, appropriate to make use of and B we continue to use in centimeters there. When we do that, then what happens is this absorptivity is now called as molar absorptivity and that is very 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 important there. Earlier it used to be called as molar extinction coefficient and things like that, those terms are obsolete now. We have to use a term called as absorptivity and molar absorptivity and this is expressed as epsilon and has the units of centimeter inverse, mole inverse, decimeter cube. Okay. So, that is very very important, one has to understand that what is the unit of concentration you are taking accordingly we will be talking about absorptivity or molar absorptivity. So, in the light of this our expression for Lambert Beer law or Beer Lambert law as it is called becomes that log of I naught by I to be equal to epsilon BC. So, this is for the epsilon basically refers to molar absorptivity there. Now, let us go a little further, uh, but before you go further let us make another important statement here that this molar absorptivity is a characteristic property of the compound and is not affected by the concentration or length of the path, light path that means the, the thickness of the medium there. So, this is very very important. So, it is intrinsic to the species being determined over there. Okay. There are few more terms which you have to take note of. This term the left hand side of the things which have been talk, expression we have been talking so far log of I naught by I is actually called as absorbance and given a symbol as A. If it is put like this our expression now becomes A is equal to that, that is what the definition of it is there A is equal to log of I naught by I and if I put it over here our expression now becomes A is equal to A B C or epsilon B C. Let to clear A is the capital here on absorbance is capital A, absorptivity is small a, B is the thickness, C is the concentration or epsilon is the molar extension coefficient, molar absorptivity not extension coefficient that term is obsolete now. Now, there are few more terms which you have to take note of, one happens to be transmittance. It is a fraction of the incident radiation that is transmitted by the absorbing medium. So, so far we were talking about what is absorbed, now we are talking about what is not absorbed, but transmitted out and that actually is given by the ratio of I to I naught, I is the transmitted intensity and I naught is the incident intensity. Okay. Now, second term is percentage transmittance which basically is uh, percentage t, we just take the fraction that the percentage t will be i by i naught multiplied by 100 percent. This is a fraction here, 
we just make the fraction as a whole number we just multiply by 100 so you get a number which is easier to talk about so percentage transmittance is used very often now let's see that's how absorbance that is a and t are related so a is equal to minus of log t this again will be a useful expression uh, when we do some kind of problems on that okay let's move further and take up a few applications of beer lambert law or applications of UV visible spectrophotometry or spectroscopy or spectrometry, whatever you want to call them as. So, there are very, very pertinent and important applications. I will be just giving a few of them. Uh, one typical one, the most common one, which is basically an application of Beard Lambert law to be more specific, is determination of concentration. Let me take a simple problem here. Now, beta carotene gives an absorption maxima at 494 nanometers. The molar absorptivity is found to be 5.88 into the power 4 that is I have not given the units here, uh, it should have been there. Uh, what concentration of beta carotene taken in 1 centimeter cubit would give an absorbance of 0 0.9 at 494 nanometer. So, basically this is a very simple application of the formula. So, we know that A that is absorbance is equal to epsilon B C and what you are given is we know the value of A, we are given to it to be 0 0.9, epsilon has been given to us uh, and B also is given to us as a thickness. So, the concentration can be computed by simple substitution there that is 0.9 you just substitute that you get expression to be this is the concentration here. So, we see that this is a very very convenient formulation which can be made use of to determine the concentration of species if you know the epsilon that is if you know the molar absorptivity we can find the concentration. Suppose we want the concentration known to you you can even find the molar absorptivity let us see that. Now, I am taking small problem again say 0 0.04 molar solution of isoprene is taken in a cubit of 1 centimeter path length and it showed an absorbance of 0 0.8 compute its molar absorptivity. Okay. This again uh, is a very simple problem wherein we are going to use the Lambert Beer law expression and just have to rearrange the expression there. So, we know that A is equal to epsilon B C we rearrange that you get epsilon on the left hand side to be equal to absorbance by B C make substitutions there simply because absorbance is given to be 0.8 and then B and C, B is given to be 1 centimeter, C is given to us as 0 0.04 molar, we make substitution, we get it to be equal to 20,000 mole inverse decimeter cube. We see that they, these two are very simple applications of Beer Lambert law or Lambert Beer law uh, because both of the terms are used there, some people call it as Beer Lambert law, some call it as Lambert Beer law. Okay. Let me take up quickly take up two more applications that is one is measuring rate of a reaction. Now, how do we make use of UV spectrophotometry in measuring rates of reaction is uh, the possibility is there if it so happens that one of the reactants or the products that absorbs UV or visible light selectively at a wavelength in which other reactants do not absorb or either their absorbance happens to be very very small. If that happens to be so then we can definitely make use of this tool to follow the kinetics of the reaction there. One simple example is uh, uh, kind of removal of a proton from this carbon here uh, in the nitroethane by hydroxyl ions there. Now, this reaction actually this molecule happens to be the, the product which is coming out is absorbs this does not. So, what we do is this absorbs at about 248 nanometers. So, what we do we start measuring absorbance or uh, at uh, 248 nanometers as a function of time we do that. So, you find that absorbance will keep on increasing because this basically gives me a direct measure of the concentration of this species being formed a data but basically is the domain of kinetics. Essentially, the, the basic data in any kinetic experiment is uh, the concentration versus time. So, this gives me a measure of because we know that Beer Lambert law tells me that absorbance is directly proportional to the concentration if you know the epsilon and B. So, I make use of that fact here and try to measure the absorbance as a function of time. So, this curve gives me the basic kinetic data which I can make use of to determine the other parameters from there that is one application. Another application could be determination of pKa. This also is used very often and the requirements here are that is because typically in case of pKa you have some compound there which ionizes. So, there is an acidic form there is a basic form there. That means, if you take a material there, it has a acidic form, you add base to that, you get this ionized there. So, either the basic form is uh, colored 
or the acidic form is color if one of them happens to be colored we can comfortably make use of this technique or it so happens that this acidic form and the basic form they absorb both of them absorb but they absorb at very very different wavelengths so that there's no interference then also we can make use of this so this technique is uh, used very often to determine the pk in such cases there now let's take the example of determination of pk of methyl red as indicator now what you find is that methyl red in the acidic form is red in the basic form it is yellow and the spectra of the two forms are distinctly different there so acidic form and the basic form they absorb at different wavelengths so we can comfortably make use of a spectrophotometry to determine the pk there what basically is done is you take the indicator uh, this methyl red at a given ph and try to find out uh, the absorbance at two different because one of them happens to be for the acidic uh, this is the pk uh, this is the absorbance maxima or the spectrum for the acidic form this is for the basic form there so what we do is say i take a solution here uh, of methyl red at a given ph make measurement at this lambda max and also at this lambda max so both of them will give me that contributions of each one of them i vary the ph we'll find that one of the component is decreasing other component is increasing so we keep doing that that means we take the mixture at different ph values and make measurements at these two lambda max values one for the uh, acidic form one for the basic form and then process the data to get the value of pka so that is a very simple but very very useful uh, application of uh, spectrophotometry let's take another application there uh, that is thermal melting of dna this is a very very interesting uh, application what basically is done is uh, let's understand we all know that dna is a double helical mo uh, molecule and if i heat a sample of dna suppose i take a solution of dna and heat it when i heat it uh, this dna the double helix is held together by hydrogen bonds between the base bases there so when i heat it this hydrogen bonds break and the dna unwinds and separates out that means the double helix opens up into two single strands there when that happens this process of opening up is accompanied by hyperchromism you, you remember hyperchromism was when uh, some factor which increases the absorbance there so in this case what happens is when this uh, dna uh, strands when they unwind so there is a increase in the uh, absorbance over there hyperchromism comes into play and this process occurs at a characteristic temperature for a dna sample under given conditions let's let's look at this picture here this basically also called as a denaturation so we have a double helical dna when you heat it this opens up into two different strands single stranded uh, single strands over there what you find is that when this happens so there actually what happens is when the dna is formed this base pairs they stack when they stack the hypochromism comes into picture when the unwind uh, that stacking interaction is lost and what happens is we get hyperchromism and that actually can be used uh, in the following way so what you do is uh, you take a sample of dna measure its absorbance there start heating it at a constant rate say this is the 75 76 you can keep on increasing temperature so we find that as temperature increases dna starts unwinding and the absorbance keeps on increasing and you get a very smooth beautiful curve over there so i am showing you here two curves there so one is say tm here say this may be tm1 tm2 so the value of tm this is having certain value here this is much larger than that so this magnitude the value of this tm that depends on the composition of dna because if the dna contains more of gc base pairs it will have a higher tm value so this gives you indication about the nature or the composition of dna as well okay now let's sum up what we've done today what we've done today is we reviewed the contents of the previous sessions thereafter we explained the principle of a spectrophotometer that means we talked about the basic components which are essential uh, for a spectrophotometer to be uh, put to use and then we talked about two different types of spectrophotometers that is a single beam and double beam spectrophotometer thereafter we took up the principle of uv visible spectrophotometry wherein we talked about the beer law and the lambert's law and beer lambert law and then thereafter we took up important applications of uv visible spectrophotometry in the next session we will take up the correlation between structure and the spectra that means 
how do we correlate the lambda max of a given molecule and the structural components of that, what is the chromophore, other substituents on that. So, we will see the effect of substituents on the lambda max in a qualitative way. We will see that this gives us a very important predictive tool. We can use this kind of a data to even predict the lambda max for a given